All right, I want to welcome you back, and we're going to now get into our sixth assignment dealing with um, parables. So we have worked so far with narrative text, we've worked with epistles, we've worked with poetry, and now we're going to work with parables. And you'll see on your, there's a chart, personal Bible study chart, you'll see there's some information about each of those book types that we are working with there in your manual. So if you can turn over there and just take a look, you can see. And every time you work with one of the different book types, just recall this information that we have for you here so that you know how to work with that particular kind of writing. Every one of the writings is different, and you cannot study them all the same. So you have to learn how to look at the different kinds of writings, and from there... Uh, You'll, you'll find that there's a very specific way you want to look at them and study them. All right, so uh, for example, narratives, remember we're looking for people, places, events, and the emotions involved in the story. Uh, when we work with epistles, we're looking for ideas uh, that the text is developing for us. When we work with poetry, we're looking for parallelisms that are going to be found in the text. When we work with parables now, You'll notice what it says here in your, in your chart. It says uh, these are found in the Gospels, Jesus' teachings, and scattered throughout the Old Testament. So we know that if you remember the hand where we looked at put all the books of the Bible, and so we know that actually uh, there's lots of parables in the Gospels here that we placed in the, between the fingers here. And you have your beginning books of the Old Testament, the history books of the Old, and the the uh, book of Acts, the history book of the New, so forth. So, so you have these parables, and actually they're just scattered. You'll find a lot of parables scattered throughout the Bible. And what we're looking for now, what's the main feature? Notice it says uh, writers use true-to-life stories, not necessarily actual events, to illustrate a point of emphasis. There's often a hidden meaning that must be searched out in a parable, all right? And, and then if you turn over a couple pages there, you'll see we have a little more information about parables. It says, a parable is an art form Jesus used frequently to deliberately hide the truth from unresponsive, but at the same time would explain the meaning to those that really wanted to know the truth. And, and so we're going to see that today as we work with a parable, how He's going to tell a parable, and it's going to have a hidden meaning in it. And so later, he's going to explain it, but he's going to explain it to only those that are really interested in knowing the truth. And so we'll see that as we work with the parable. All right, now I want you to turn over to the uh, sixth assignment. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at one of the classic parables in, in our New Testament, and that's the parable of what we call the sower. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at that and it's in Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. I want you to read that first several times. And then we're going to go through and remember we've been outlining. And so we're going to do an outline form here. All right. And then we're going to look for the central point of emphasis because every parable is going to have a point of emphasis. And it's very important to find that point of emphasis. And then we're going to do a charting, and I'm going to show you how to do the chart. It'll be just a little bit different than what we've been doing. And then you're going to formulate your own questions for another small group Bible study. So you remember the last lesson, we taught you how to go through and break the text apart and then formulate questions for a study. And so we're going to do a little exercise along that line again the same way. Now, I want you to notice the information about parables here. It says a parable is a short story that uses physical or practical examples from everyday life to illustrate a spiritual truth. Now, if you've got a pencil, underline that, a spiritual truth. Jesus often taught in parables, so it's critical for us to understand this special kind of literary form. When you, Jesus taught with the parables, there was an additional purpose. He wanted to obscure the truth from the unresponsive, and at the same time make it plain to the responsive. Note that although historic events can be used as illustrations, a parable is a special story form designed specifically 
to teach a particular truth. Again, underline that, all right? Although by definition, a parable is not the record of historic events. To be a parable, it must be true to life. And so, again, the parable is going to be given, but they're going to give only one point of emphasis in the parable. You will not find two, three, or four uh, points of emphasis. There's always going to be just one for a parable. So don't make the mistake of many people where they have tried to tie several points of emphasis together in a parable. You cannot do that. The writer had one intention involved in telling the parable. And so you want to find that, and it's very, very important. Okay, if you'll look at the next page there, we have some guidelines that you need to understand for working with parables. And if you would take your Bible and turn to Luke uh, chapter 15, we will illustrate from that what we're talking about now. Luke chapter 15. All right, so the guidelines, the first guideline for working with parables is it says begin with the immediate context. What is the occasion for the telling of the story? And then what is an explanation of the parables mean? So you're going to look, first of all, for the occasion of the story. That would be the setting or the context. So if you look at this parable of the lost sheep in uh, in Luke chapter 15, we see that the, the occasion for the story is that it says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him, to Jesus, to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying. And so he, now he's going to go into the parable that he's going to tell but you see the occasion or the setting for the parable is very important to pick up because many times what they'll do is they'll run several parables off that setting, that occasion. And we'll see that where he's going to not only talk about the one lost sheep, but then he's going to talk about the one lost coin and he's going to give the parable of the lost son. You know, so you have a, 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 a bunch of parables that flow from this context or this setting. Because that context is going to set the idea. It's going to help you to pick up what the idea of what he's talking about. So we know that the religious leaders, they're complaining because Jesus eats with sinners. So now he's going to tell the story. So we first look for that immediate context. Critical to pick it up, what it is. And then uh, we're going to continue to look for an explanation as we go through. And so notice the parable. It says, what man of you having... Uh, lost, uh, having a, a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not go, leave and uh, the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that was lost until he finds it. And when he is found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, uh, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And Verse 7 says, And I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. And so as I read the parable, what the parable was, then I noticed at the end there he gave an explanation. That was in verse 7. All right, so I'm looking for that explanation as I read through the parable. I know I've got to get the context first, that setting uh, of the parable. And then I want to really identify, secondly, that point of emphasis of the parable. And we know in this particular parable, it's the parable of the lost sheep. It's the one lost sheep. And so that's the point of emphasis for that particular parable. And then we do have an explanation for it. All right, then the second parable that Jesus will tell about the lost coin. And he says, or uh, what woman, uh, having... Ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which was lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of angels over 
uh, of God over one sinner who repents. All right, so there you have uh, uh, the emphasis of the one sinner now who repents. So again, I want to get that point of emphasis. And then notice it says, identify irrelevant details, details that wouldn't intend to be uh, intended to be teaching any particular truth. And then the first parable, it's the 99 safe sheep. That's not a point of emphasis. I have heard pastors use that as a point of emphasis, and it totally misses the point of the text. Uh, the nine safe coins, again, in the parable of the coins would be uh, an irrelevant point. So you, you want to look for those, okay? And then fourthly, it says, identify relevant details. Those intended to teach some truth will be reinforced in a central theme, such as the prodigal son that was once lost and now is found. And so each parable now, when Jesus explains that parable, uh, he, he's letting us know for the sheep, he's referring to, obviously, the one lost sheep would be one sinner who repents. Now remember, in the context, the setting, the, the religious leaders were grumbling about uh, Jesus associating with sinners. And so that's why he tells this parable to drive home his point, the importance of lost sinners. Because you'll notice he also says, uh, there's great joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And what he does there is, is he, he's really poking the finger at the religious leaders there who think that they are righteous. They think that they are holy. They don't need repentance. They don't see their need for it. And so the religious leaders, they were, they were men who thought they were holy. And so Jesus really is pointing a finger at them as he gives an explanation because of, of, uh, of that particular parable. And then, of course, the second parable of the lost coin in a reference to one lost sinner again. And he says, likewise, I say to you that there is joy in the presence of angels over of God over one sinner who repents. And so again, he's, he's emphasizing the importance of realizing that, uh, that we're all sinners and we all need to repent and there's great joy when a sinner will repent. So that's the way the parables work. They will, they will, uh, there will be an, uh, a, uh, information given to you at the beginning of the parable and then you follow that through the parable. But again, Jesus was emphasizing to these religious leaders the importance of the, the lost soul. All right, and they, their need for repentance. So that's how we're working with the parables. Those are some things that you need to remember. And again, don't forget, you are looking for just one point of emphasis in the parable, not two or three. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the parable. And the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to go through and, and read the parable. you got 20 verses, so you're going to go through, read it, and you're going to first uh, outline it in this way, and what you're going to do first is look for the introduction of that parable. So he gives a context, a setting for the parable that he's going to talk about in this parable of the sower, and then he's going to, I want you to tell me the verses of the, the setting, and then tell me the verses of the parable, all right? And so outline that. And then uh, thirdly, he's going to give, after the parable, he's going to give some insights how you work with all parables. And it's very, very helpful to pick up what he's talking about here. And so he's going to give some additional insights that will help you whenever you work with a parable that uh, you need to understand. So he's going to give you some understanding. And then what he will do at the, at the last part of the text, he's going to give you an explanation to the parable. Now, when there is an explanation to a parable, as we will see here, there is no other interpretation. You have to use what he says, and you cannot try to interpret anything else into the text. So there's only going to be one interpretation that he's going to draw, and when he gives you the interpretation in the text, then you have to use every detail of that to explain the parable. All right, does everybody understand that? It's very important, you know, that we use the explanation of the parable. All right, so once you outline the text, then we'll go through 
we'll go over that with you. And so let's take a break right now, turn off your DVD, and I want you to uh, read the text, and then I want you to break it apart for me, and I'll go over the outline with you in just a few moments. All right, I'd like to now review for you the outline. You've had a little time to, to break it apart, and, it, and it's not real complex. So in the introduction, we know that it's verses 1 and 2. Let's look at that for a moment. It says, And he began to teach again by the sea, and such a very great multitude gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down, and the whole multitude was, on the, was by the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables and saying to them in his teaching. So there is the setting for the parable that he's about to get. Verse, verses 1 and 2. And then he's going to begin as he starts in verse 3 with the parable. And he says, listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. And so we know that verse 3 is the beginning of the parable. And then he's going to go through uh, all the way down through verse 9, explaining the parable. All right? And so he starts, and I want you to notice how he begins the parable. He says, listen to this. All right? And then at the end of the parable in verse 9, notice what he says again. He said, and he was saying to them, and he, I, and he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, so right away, as you begin working with that parable, you can begin to pick up something he's really emphasizing here. He starts with listening and he ends with listening. And so, you're, you, again, it's not that hard to pick up that point of emphasis as you start to work with the parable. So, starting now, after after. He says, uh, if you have ears to hear, let them hear. And then starts in verse 10. All right. And he, it says, as soon as he was alone, along with his followers, uh, along with the twelve, he began asking him about the parable. And he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, they get everything in parables in order that while seeing they may see and not perceive, and while hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they return and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all parables? And so we see that verses 10 through 13, he's going to give us some insights here in understanding all parables. And then the closing... Uh, would be found where he explains the parables and he starts in verse 14 and he says the sower sows the word. So now he's giving us an explanation of that parable and he's going to go through the whole parable and give us an explanation of everything he's talked about in the parable in detail. So it's verses 14 all the way down to 20. So there we have the outline for the parable. Okay, so everybody's got the idea. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to move to the second step of our study, which is we're going to chart this information. Again, it's very important to get the overall picture first through the outline. And then the second step is that we're going to chart this information. All right, so I'm going to flip the board here and I'm going to show you the chart and how I'm going to work with it, especially as I prepare for another small group Bible study. I'm going to, again, leave space in between my observations, my interpretations and applications. And, and, and I'm going to, every time I make an observation, leave a space. Every time I make a second one, again, my space. So every observation, interpretation, application is going to have a space under it that I will come back later and draw up questions for my small group Bible study. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to take starting verse 1, and I'm going to go through, and you'll see I just put down just a little bit of verse 1. He began to teach again by the sea. So there's my observation. And my interpretation is we, I know that uh, from studying the Scriptures, Jesus 
he frequently taught by the sea. It was a very good place to teach. And one of the reasons he would do that is because the, uh, there's tremendous amount of acoustics that work very nicely on the sea. And when you get thousands of people, think about how could they all hear without a, a, a loudspeakers. And, and so he had these settings and these places where he could teach and thousands would be able to hear him, you know, without him screaming at the top of his lungs. There, his voice would carry. And, uh, and so, again, the, the second part of the verse where it talks about he got into the boat in the sea and he sat down and the whole multitude was on the sea by the, on the land there. So, so the people, he moved out a little bit on the sea. And again, that sound will carry beautifully off the sea as he speaks. But I want you to also notice the interesting thing where, uh, how, he was, how he was teaching there. It's fascinating. It said he was sitting down. A lot of people, you know, you rarely see anybody teaching sitting down. You're standing up. But there's nothing wrong with sitting down. And when I'm in a small group of people doing a Bible study like this, I'm sitting down with them because I don't want to be above them. I, I want to be right on their level with them. So anyway, there's just a little information there. And I would chart ber- verses 1 and 2. And I'm just doing my normal rules of how I would make my observations, interpretations, and applications. All right. So once I get to the parable, though, now, starting in verse 3, he, he begins by saying, listen to this. So that's the first thing I'm going to write down, all right? And, and I know that uh, as I read those verses from the verse 3 all the way through verse 9, he was emphasizing listening there. So I, uh, and then I made an application, I need to listen to Jesus. All right, then he begins and he says, a sower went out to sow. Now, uh, I know from the second part of the explanation of the parable, what he's talking about here, it's explained to me that the sower sows the word in verse 14. So what I'm doing, because this is a parable, I am going to only explain what the parable tells me. So you see, I don't have the freedom just to just to draw my own interpretation here. Of what I have to use what the text says because there is no other interpretation of it. So I'm going to use what the text says. So I went over to verse 14 and I saw where he talks about the sower and explaining that. And then I made my own personal application uh, of that. All right. So that's how we're going to work with it. Each time you draw an observation and it came about that as, as he was sowing some seed, fell beside the road. So we know that's the first place the seed fell, was beside the road. And uh, I know that, you know, we know that the the road would be a a kind of a soil, because he's going to be talking about four kinds of soils here, uh, where the seed will fall. We know that that soil beside the road, it's it's hardened, because it has lots of of, uh, uh, travel that's going along that. So there's no place for that seed to penetrate And so I made a little application there. I must not allow God's word to fall on hard hearts. Yeah, and so I I, I want his word to go to where they they really want to receive it, all right? Well, the next thing that he says is the birds came and ate it up. And so I I know from verse 15, all right, uh, uh, Satan is referred to as the birds. And so that's the emphasis. And so I have to, again, explain that. All right. Sometimes, like the first explanation here that I drew out, there, there's, the text doesn't give us a real, it doesn't come out and just say this, but it's obvious that the road would be hard. And so we know that he's talking about a hardened soil here. All right. And we're going to find out what kind of soil that is uh, as it's compared to the heart of man. All right, and so you see, what I'm going to do now, as much as you can, as you, as you draw your observations, you'll see the second uh, place that he talks about in the, in the parable is the seed fell on the rocky ground. So then I wanted to look at the text, and I'll see that you know, he talks about that in verse 16, where he's going to talk about what it, he explains what rocky ground is. So my, again, my interpretation is coming from verse 16, Uh, as I explain what that means. So hopefully you're getting the idea that what you're doing now, just with this parable, all right, in itself, I'm going to 
chart it out, but I'm not going to interpret it just on my own. I've got to work with the text to tell me what, it, what does it really mean, okay? So it's, I want you to be very careful to do that and uh, mark down the verse numbers where you're drawing that when you can, uh, uh, your, your interpretation, so they'll get the idea. And so you're going to go through and you're going to see there's four kinds of soils that he's going to talk about. And so you want to develop each one of those soils and what does he mean by that. Then when you get to the section where he talks about in verses 10 through 13 where he's going to give him the keys to understanding all parables. And, and, and he asks the disciples a question, do you not understand this parable? How are you going to understand all parables? And so what you're going to do with the, that information, 10 through 13, now you're just going to go back to your normal rules that we do typically when we work with most of our, uh, our charting our different studies where we're going to make the observation. I'm going to work with the text as much as I can to help me to interpret the meaning and then draw some applications there. And so you're just going to go back to your normal rules for verses 10 through 13. And then uh, the verses 14 to 20, basically you don't really need to chart those because what we're doing is we're using that to explain the meaning. You can chart them if you want, but you, the, the idea there is that we're just using those to help us to understand the meaning of the parable. So hopefully you, you got the idea here. Uh, once again, what we're doing, the first two verses, you just use your normal rules that we've been using all along for observation, interpretation, and then application. When you get to the parable, because we're working with this special kind of literary form, where if you give an, an, an answer or there's an explanation to the parable, then you have to follow this rule where you will write it down, what the text says, and then you're going to look for the verse numbers of the explanation to explain that. All right? And uh, then when you get to the, again, verses 10 through 13, you're going to just follow your normal rules again of observation, interpretation, application. So again, I just do this because I want to emphasize the importance of using the interpretation to explain the meaning. All right? Does everybody understand okay? Are we clear? All right. So I want you to go to work. I want you to work on this. And then once you have gone through and done all your observations, your interpretation, application, then you're going to come back and make up questions. All right? And you're going to ask those questions of observation like, he began to teach again by the sea. So where did Jesus teach? Where was he teaching? All right, there's the answer, you know. Uh, uh, why did Jesus teach by the sea? Well, because uh, it, it's a great place to, to communicate to people and so forth. And it's, some, uh, it's a place where he frequently taught. And, and then uh, observation question. What does Jesus say as he begins the parable? All right, listen to this. What, what, what did he mean by that? Why, why, did he, why did he say listen to this? Well, obviously he's emphasizing something. And how important is it for you to listen when Jesus speaks? To follow his advice, all right? So what's the first place? Uh, what happens to the, the, the sower? What does he do? Well, the text says he went out to sow. And, and what does that mean? Well, verse 14 explains that the sower is the reference to he's sowing not just seed, but the Word of God, all right? So you get the idea as we go through, as you ask your questions. So you're going to make your observations, your interpretations, and, and then your applications along with all your questions. All right, so go to work, stop your DVD, do the work, and then we'll review it together in just a little bit, all right? All right, I'd like to review this assignment with you now that you've taken the time to, to go through and chart it and then make up your questions. And so I'm going to go through and we'll, we'll talk about the questions later. But right now what I want to do is I want to go through and just help you to see how you work with the text. And hopefully you're understanding. It's not, I haven't confused you too much with the way we interpret the text when we have to work with the explanation there. But hopefully you'll begin to get the idea. All right, so we, we looked at the first two verses, and I just did my normal rules for charting there. As we talked about, 
We know that Jesus was working by the sea. The sea of Galilee was a, one of his favorite places, I believe, where he would teach. And I, and I understand why I've been there before. So it's just a beautiful place. And I remember one time sitting up on this mount where they believed that he was, he was uh, teaching the, the, uh, uh, what is, the Beatitudes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So he, he was teaching the Beatitudes to the, uh, uh, the, the crowd. And, and, you know, I was sitting in that very place. And it was in March. And it was just beautiful. The Rose of Sharon was all over. You could see the, sh- the flowers out there. It's the springtime. And you could see all the way across the Sea of Galilee. It was just absolutely beautiful. And, and so I can understand why Jesus would be there. But it says that he was teaching many things in parables. So now he was just talking in parables. Before this, he had been talking very clearly to the people. But now he's starting to teach in parables. And there was a, there was a reason for it. Because he, uh, people were starting to come for the wrong reasons. You know, he's working miracles. Anytime you're working miracles, you can get a huge crowd of people. You know, he's feeding people, free food. (laughs) You know, you can get a crowd real quick for that, you know. And so uh, Jesus is now speaking just in parables, and he goes a whole section here where he just gives lots of parables. And so he begins and he says, listen to this. So he's giving emphasis to hearing. And then uh, you'll notice as he closes the parable, as he was saying, he was ears to hear, let him hear. So there's a very strong emphasis in listening. Now, he says, the sower went out to sow. And so now as I look at that information, I had to go over and I looked at verse 14 and I realized that's what he's explaining. What the sower is now is... The word, so the the seed that the farmer is sowing. And by the way, these people would, many of them were involved in all kinds of agriculture. And, it, you know, just a, that's a beautiful place to grow in this, around the Sea of Galilee there. So lots of farming. So it would just be a, 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 a story that everybody would really understand. Because, you know, most of them are farmers or you know, they're working with the soil. And, and so he tells them, first of all, that the sower, he's going to go out. Everybody's going to get the idea. A sower is always sowing seed, you know. Well, Jesus explains that the sower is the word. So now this sower is the sowing the word. And, and that's really what Jesus is doing in this story here, is he's sowing the word to the crowd. All right? So he's throwing out the word to it. And, and, and so... He goes on and and he begins to tell us where the seed fell. And so it's going to fall on four different types of soil. The first one, it says it it came about as he was sowing, it it fell along the road and the birds came in it. The second soil was it, it was the seed that fell upon the rocky ground where it didn't have much soil and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, It was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And the other seed, the third seed, it fell beside uh, amongst the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. So there's the fourth type of soil. You've got the, the road soil, which is hardened. You have the rocky soil, which is crowded with rocks, and there's not much depth to it. Then you have the seed that falls in the thorns, and the thorns choke it. And then finally, he says, other seed fell in the good soil, and it grew up and increased and yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. And so he, it, he tells the parable, and then he says, that if you've got ears to hear, you need to listen. All right? So... As we go on in the parable, he he begins to explain each one of these types of soils. So we see that the second type of soil was the rocky ground. And in verse 15, he says, these are the ones, uh, no, excuse me, uh, the the first one where it comes beside the road, says uh, these are the ones who, when they hear the word, the word is sown, he says they 
hear it, and immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them or has been sown, as some of the translations say, in their hearts. All right? So now we know what he's talking about when he talks about the seed being sown in the different types of soil. He's talking about the, the, the condition of the heart. And so what we're going to see as we draw from the text, there's four different conditions of the heart that what Jesus is really talking about. But he uses the soils as the example for the people. All right. So we know that the first place, the seed falls. And because the soil is hard, it's not going to penetrate. There's no place for it to go. The second place the seed falls, he says, is among uh, the uh, rocky places. But he says in verse 16, uh, in a similar way, these are ones when the seed was sown on the rocky places, when they heard the word immediately, they received it with joy. All right, so it was well received. But he goes on to tell us that, uh, that they have no firm roots in themselves, but are only temporary. Now, why? Well, you think about the seed that falls amongst the rocks. What's the problem with that soil? Well, it's cluttered. There's too many things in it. So there's no room for the seed to go deep into the soil. And and so it's going to be a shallow soil. It's it's not, there's no depth to it for for the seed to really take root. And so he says these are like people who have a heart that that you know they they hear it with joy. You know, they're they're very responsive. And then uh, he says but they're very shallow. They don't have any firm, no firm root in them. And it's only temporary. And then when the afflictions or the persecution arise because of the word, immediately they fall away. So it's like they they just don't do well because their their soil is so shallow. So you have a heart that is a a shallow heart. There's no depth to it. And it's kind of an impulsive heart. You know people like that? You know people that, you know, I've had people come to my church and they'd come up to me after the service and they were all excited. And they go, Pastor, man, this is such a really good church. You know, this is our first Sunday here. We're just loving it. We just love that worship. Man, what a great worship team. And, and then the teaching, it was so good. And we just really love this church, you know. And you're standing there going, oh, great, you know. And guess what? That's the last time I ever see them. They never come back. Why? Well, because their, their, their hearts are shallow. They're, they respond. Uh, there's this impulsive response from their heart, but there's no depth to it. And so he says the result is they fall away. All right? So, so that's, the first, that's the second thing. Uh, condition of the heart that he explains for us. The third condition was the seed that fell among the thorns. And it says the thorns came up and it choked it and it yielded no crop. And so I have to go over to, to verse 18 now and look and see what he talks about there. And he says, uh, the other w- are, are the ones whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word And the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So we see that these people hear the word, but their heart is crowded. It's over-involved with so many things. Notice what it says, the worries of the world. You know, there's a lot of worries in this world, isn't there? You can worry about, am I going to have enough money to buy bread, buy food? Am I going to have enough money to pay for gas? Am I going to have enough money to, to pay for my rent? Or, you know, all the different things that we need money for. You know, you, the, these, those are part of the worries uh, of the world that he says. And so he compares that, that, that seed that falls in the thorns to a heart that is... is so over-involved in the cares of the world. And, and notice the second thing he says, deceitfulness of riches. Now, 
is there anything wrong with money? No, there's nothing wrong. But it says, I want you to notice, it says deceitfulness of riches. Riches can deceive you. They can lead you to think that you don't need anything else. You got it all. And some of the richest people in the world, I knew one man that committed suicide at 40 years of age. He was incredibly rich, multimillionaire. But he took his life because he couldn't find happiness. He couldn't buy it. And, and, and so the, the, the cares of the world, the things uh, that were all around, the riches, they deceived this man to think that he would have everything that he wanted. And then he talks about desires for other things, entering and choke the word. And so we know that, again, the, the, there's just so many things that can come into our lives and choke God's word so that our hearts are not going to be able to receive. They're going to become over-involved. And it's easy today to get over-involved in all kinds of things. Even in ministry, you can get so over-involved that you don't take time to really grow in your own relationship with the Lord. And I know lots of pastors that burn out in the ministry because they just haven't taken time to grow in their own faith. They just are so busy ministering to everybody else. All right, so the third soil now, we know according to verse 8, was the seed that fell on the good soil. And as they grew up, they increased and yield a crop that produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. And so we, we know that he explains in verse 20 what that good soil is. And he says, those are the ones whom the seed was sown in the good soil, they hear the word, they accept it, they bear fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. And so the, the question is, what makes good soil? Well, you've got to get into the fertile soil, don't you? But how do you get there? Well, Jesus said this kind of a heart is a heart that's receptive. It's a heart that uh, hears the word, accepts it, and acts upon it. And so you see, the receptive heart is the one that is going to be fruitful. And the result is, they bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Now, I've often wondered what that means. And one day I was talking with a farmer, and this guy understood what 30, 60, and 100 fold meant. He said, if I get a 30 fold harvest, he said, I'm happy about it. That's good. If I get a 60-fold harvest, I'm really happy about it. I like that a lot. But a 100-fold, it's an incredible thing to have a 100-fold harvest. But, but the, the point of what the parable is telling us is that, that there will be fruit from a heart that is open and receptive to God. He's going to bless you abundantly in everything you do, as we learned from Psalm 1. He wants to richly bless our lives. And so there's the, the, the four types of heart. You have the hard, calloused heart. That's the hard soil. You have the impulsive, shallow heart that responds very quickly to everything. And then you have the over-involved heart, which is the crowded heart. And then fourthly, we have the receptive heart. So those are the four heart conditions that we see in man. Now, I want to take you back to verses 10 through 13. Very important, because they're going to give us an understanding here of how to understand all parables. Now, notice it says in verse 10, as soon as he was alone... His followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. So as I would chart that, I would notice, first of all, that he's alone now. He's away from the crowd. But notice who's with him. Do you see who's with him? It says that it's some of his, is his followers, along with the twelve. So we know there was some, a group of followers. We don't know how many that is. And then he has the twelve disciples. They're all with him there. All right, And notice what they did. It says they began to ask him about the parable. So did they understand the parable? No, they hadn't got it. 
And, and so they're asking about it, and then Jesus responds to them, and he says, and he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, they get everything in parables. What in the world is he talking about? He says, you have been given the mystery of the kingdom. What's the mystery? Think about that for a moment. A mystery is something you don't understand. You don't have an insight to. And Jesus said, he's giving you the mystery of the kingdom of God. And then he gives us two groups of people. He says, to those who are outside, all right, I'm just going to write that down right here. You've got outsiders. All right, there's one group. And so if you've got outsiders, logically you have insiders. So we've got two groups of people here that Jesus is talking about. He says, to you has been given the mystery... They would be the insiders, but to those who are outside, they get everything in parables. So think about it for a moment. Who would the outsiders be in the parable? Would it not be the crowd? Yeah. It would be the large crowd of people that had heard the parable. Did they understand the parable? No. The insiders, Jesus says, to you has been given the mystery. All right. Now, did they understand the parable? No. Neither one of them understood. But who got the mystery? Who got the revelation to the parable? Well, it was the insiders. But how did they get that insight? Well, there's only one way they could get it. You know what they did? They asked. They, they, they didn't get it, and so they came to Jesus and said, Jesus, we didn't understand that parable, so... Can you explain that to us? So do you understand what what the text is helping us to see here? Is that if you want to know the meaning of of a parable, you have to ask. You have to seek for an answer. You see, these outsiders, they never sought for an answer. They heard the story. Oh, it's an interesting story. But they didn't pursue an answer. And if you don't pursue an answer, you're never going to know. And there's a lot of people like that today. They, they hear the story, but they don't pursue it. They don't get, try to really understand. And when you study the Bible, you can't just read it. You have to study it. Because you'll never understand it if you don't take time to probe it and look at it. And, and, and with a parable, you had to ask for an answer. And so it is, I believe, with any scripture, as you work with the scriptures, you have to seek for an answer. And as you ask the Holy Spirit, he will guide you to get the insight. And so he says to those who are outside, they just get everything in parables. They just get the story. But the insider, they get the meaning. All right? Now, notice what he says next to him. It's very interesting. Uh, He's quoting from actually Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verses 4 through 10. And it says, in order that while seeing they may see and not perceive, and while hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they return and be forgiven. So uh, we know that in Isaiah, in the context there, Isaiah was, was speaking to a group of Israelites that really didn't want to hear. They had closed their ears, they had closed their eyes, and, uh, and, and so... It, it, it almost sounds here in this quote like, you know, they, 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 they can see, but they're not ever going to really see. And while hearing, they may hear and not understand, lest they return and be forgiven. Like, I really don't want them to return and forgive. But if you look at the context, and then if you look uh, over in the Gospel of Matthew, just turn over there for a moment with me. Matthew chapter 13 starting in verse 14. Matthew gives us a little more insight into that, into that uh, what Jesus was saying there. All right, Mark is very brief. But in uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 14, he says this, And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and not understand, seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts 
of the people have grown cold or dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes, they have closed. You notice who's responsible for their condition? Is God responsible for it? No, the people are. They have closed their eyes. He says, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand so that their hearts should turn so that I should heal them. God wants to heal. He wanted to bring healing to the children of Israel, but they refused to respond. And as a result, judgment was brought upon them. But you see, they had made the choice to close their ears. They had made the choice to close their eyes. And and so that's what Jesus is talking about. People that don't want to hear. The people, the crowd, they heard the parable, but they really didn't want to know the meaning. If they had of, they would have pursued for an answer. All right. And so he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all parables? And the way we understand all parables, if we don't understand it, and sometimes you're going to have a parable where there is not an explanation to it. And when you do that, you use your normal rules to work with the context and the setting, and it will help you to interpret and get the idea. And usually it's not that complicated to figure it out, what he's talking about. You know? But when you're given the answer, then that's the only answer you're going to get. So you, but when you work with it, you have to seek for an answer. You need to go to Jesus. Jesus, I need, to, your, I need your help right now to understand this parable. I'm not getting it. I tell you, I've done that a lot over the years, and the Lord has been so good to help me to understand. All right, so now we've gone through the parable. We see that Jesus gave the parable to, to the disciples and, uh, and his followers. He's explaining it to them. And, and, and he wants them to see there's four different heart conditions. Now, I want to show you something. Uh, I have heard this text taught many times. And I believe many times it's taught incorrectly. You know why? Because they will emphasize, their point of emphasis is on evangelism. Now, you can see evangelism in this context. You 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 can pick it up from that. But I don't believe that's the main idea of the parable. Because, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, you'll hear the evangelist talk about, okay, well, that first type of soil, is that's the hard heart. And if you've got a hard heart, you know, you're not going to respond to Jesus. Or if you've got a, a shallow heart, you know, you're, again, you're, you're, you might respond, but you're not, you're not going to last. You're going to fall away. You've got the uh, over-involved or the crowded heart, and you're just too many things of the world, and it's going to draw you away, and so you're not... Gonna, you're not going to follow Jesus. And then you've got uh, the uh, receptive heart, which would be a believer. The first three, heart, three, first three conditions are unbelievers, typically explain, explained that way. But I want you to see something. The point of emphasis, remember Jesus said, listen. And then he ended the parable by saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That is the point of the, of, of the parable. He's teaching them how to hear the word and act upon it. And if you hear God's word and act upon it, you're going to be blessed by him. That's the point of emphasis. And so therefore, I think it's more than evangelism, although you could use this towards evangelism, but it's really not the point of the text. It's a side issue, but the main point is that you have to hear and respond to the gospel. Now, once you've responded to the gospel... Is it possible for you to have a hard heart as a believer? Did the disciples, did we just not see that in our last study? Disciples had a hard heart. And so it's possible for believers to have hard hearts. Is it possible for uh, believers to become shallow in their walk with Jesus? Yes. Is it possible for believers to get over-involved, overcrowded in their lives? Yes. Is it possible for believers to be receptive? Of course it is. We can be receptive, and that's, of course, where we want to get to. But I believe what Jesus is emphasizing, and notice who he's talking to. 
He's not talking to unbelievers here. He's talking to his followers and the twelve. And what I believe he's emphasizing to them is that your heart can go anywhere of these four places. But if you want to be productive in the kingdom of God, you've got to get into the good soil. And I believe that's the point of the parable. Now, does that make sense to you a little bit? Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense because, because Jesus wants those disciples to know that they, if their hearts hardened, they're going to block what God wants to do through them. He wants them to know if they get shallow, where they become impulsive in, in their, their relationship with the Lord, that, that it's not, they're not going to be productive in that. Or if they get a heart that is, becomes overcrowded and get over-involved, uh, you're, you're not going to be effective in the kingdom of God. I believe it's possible to go to heaven. You receive Christ into your life and you're sincere. I believe anybody can go to heaven if they receive Christ sincerely. But you see, we're not here just to receive Christ, but we're here to serve Him. And He's looking for vessels that will be open and responsive to Him. And you can go through your whole life. I've known people that there's no doubt they're a believer. They believe in Christ, but they never use their gifts and abilities that God gave them to expand the kingdom of God and their life became a waste. Did they lose their salvation? No. I don't think that that's, that's, uh, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So I don't really think that's possible to lose our salvation, but certainly we are going to be judged, we know in the end, for our works, what we have done with Christ Jesus. And so he's going to look at us and we need to, to uh, move in that direction of opening to him, having an open heart so that he can use us for his honor and glory. But a lot of Christians just don't get involved. They get caught up in all these other things that pull them away. And again, we have to remember why we're here. We're here to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Okay, I hope that this has been helpful to you as we've gone through it together. Uh, Let me just show you a few questions. If I was leading a small group Bible study, these would be some of the questions that I would ask as I went through on my chart here. Uh, I, I would ask, where was Jesus teaching? Observation question. How big was the crowd? Well, we know it was a really big crowd, so he had to push out away from the shore there. All right, observation question. Uh, What did Jesus do uh, have to do because of the crowd? Well, he had to get away and he had to push out into the sea a little bit. Uh, Did Jesus teach standing or sitting? Okay, get him to look at that from the text. These are all observation questions. And, And then, how did he teach the crowd? Well, we know he taught in parables. All right, uh, describe a parable or what is a parable. And then describe it. What, what, what's the idea of a parable? All right. And then, uh, uh, who is the sower? What does the seed represent? Uh, what does the, the four soils represent? Uh, where does the seed fall first? What is the problem with that type of soil? What happens when the seed is sown there? What happens to the heart condition of this person? Where is the next place the seed falls? What happens to to this seed? What is the problem with this type of soil? What is the problem with the heart here? Where uh, where does the seed fall next? What happens to it? What is the uh, heart condition here? Where is the last place the seed falls? Well, what happens to the seed that that, that is in this soil? Why is it fruitful? How can it become fruitful? After uh, After the soil's permanent condition are the soils permanent conditions in people or are they conditions of the heart that can change? What are the two groups Jesus classified people in? Uh, what, what, are they bo- what do they both have in common? Why do the insiders get the ministry, mystery? Uh, what does Jesus want me to do uh, when I do not understand a parable? What is the key to being productive? And so there you go. Those are just some questions. Uh, and again, they can be a variety of questions, but those are some that I would ask. Now, again, I have to be careful when I prepare my questions for my small group that I'm going to have enough time to cover them. You know, now, if I ask 
like about, if I have about 50 questions on my list, chances are you're not going to get through that many questions. So uh, if I'm going to do an hour Bible study, then I, I got to learn to ask a, a, the, those amount of questions that are going to lead them through the text in that period of time. And, and so again, also I have to remember who I'm working with. If I'm working with new Christians, then I'm going to I have to ask maybe just a few different kinds of questions. I have done this kind of study with non-Christians. So you're going to have a little different kind of a Bible study. Or if you're doing it in Sunday school, you can have a Bible study just like this with kids in Sunday school. It's a great way to get them into the Word by asking them questions from the story that you've just gone through. And uh, they can get a lot from it. So there's a lot of ways that you can use this. But hopefully you're getting the idea now of how to work with... um, a text in the, in the in a parable. It's again a little different kind of a study, but uh, it's a great way to get into the Word. And then, of course, if you have a small group Bible study, it's a it's a wonderful way to guide them into the text and helping them to get the truths from the text. Okay, so hopefully this lesson has been a helpful time to use the study of parables.